Hey church, uh, if you have a Bible, and I hope you do, would you open it to 1 Peter chapter 2? 1 Peter 2. Um, as you can tell, we're not in my house again, and I, am, I think my wife is super thankful about that. But we're making these steps to beginning to worship together again, and I am so thankful for that. I, I've, I've missed worshiping with all of y'all, although I'm very thankful for what we've been able to do through technology. And I, I will say this, uh, we're going to continue to either record a separate service to air or to soon live stream so that uh, if it's not the best time for you to join us, we'll be ready when you are. First uh, Peter chapter 2. You know, I was thinking uh, the other day, it's been, I believe it was March 10th, when I heard that a student in the neighboring school system um, had contracted COVID-19. And then March 11, I heard that as a church, we weren't going to be able to meet in the school that we were meeting in again, at least not while this was, was happening. And as a, as, a, as a church planter, that was a huge deal, just trying to figure out how are we going to meet, what are we going to do, but little did I know that that was really the tip of the spear of what was to come. And if you think back, Think back just over these past few months what it's been like because it, we, we heard about folks now even in, in, in the States and then in Indiana that had contracted COVID-19 and then we started to realize that this pandemic was real and then we went into quarantine. And think about even in your life, you know, all the changes that happened and then if, as if that weren't enough. We started to hear names like Ahmed Arbery, George Floyd, riots, police being targeted. You know, have you ever seen one of those books, those worst case scenario books? 2020 has been of a bit, been very similar to one of those worst case scenario books. Honestly, it's been a bit of a dumpster fire. And the question that we've been wrestling with as we as we go through this crazy time, is how are we supposed to live as Christians through the middle of all this? And we've been looking at uh, 1 Peter, and if you, you remember, 1 Peter is written by the Apostle Peter that, that lived and walked with Christ, and he's a blue-collar guy. He's a fisherman by trade. Following Jesus was a long road of ups and downs and victories and failures. And what we read now was written near the end of Peter's life. And he's writing to these, these churches that are scattered across what, what's now uh, Turkey. They were dealing with persecution. And what they didn't know at this time was that the persecution was going to get worse before it got better. And in that situation, the Holy Spirit guides Peter to write these words. 1 Peter chapter 2. Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles, so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and glorify God on the day He visits. Submit to every human authority because of the Lord, whether to the emperor's supreme authority or to governors as, the, as those sent out by Him to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what is good. For it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. Submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as God's slaves. Honor everyone, love the brothers and sisters, fear God, honor the emperor. You know, we planned this out a while back, and it, it just strikes me of the the sovereignty and goodness of God. And even on the day that we begin our public um, worship services again, in the state that our country's in and the, the things that we're going through, that this would be the text. This would be the text that, that, that's chosen to, to, to preach from. 
Peter says, dear friends, I, I urge you. As a matter of fact, those of you who, who grew up around the church will remember those old translations said, I beseech you, which may be a bit archaic. And it, it's this, I strongly urge you, is what Peter is saying. I strongly urge you as strangers and exiles. It's a particular phrase there, strangers and exiles. Uh, in, in the Old Testament, it shows up a couple of times. Abraham... Remember, God sent him on a journey, and he was traveling through this land that wasn't his, and he, he, he needed to find a place to bury his wife after his wife had passed, and he, he says, I'm, I'm a stranger, and I'm an exile. In other words, I'm living among you, but this isn't my home. We also find it in Psalm 39. And what Peter's doing, uh, Peter is reminding us here is that we're strangers and exiles. In other words, we live here, but we have a different home. Because of our relationship with Christ, our home is heaven. And while we live here, we are citizens of heaven as well. He's saying, as we live as strangers and exiles, we need to remember this. I used to have a boss before I got into um, ministry, a boss that uh, what, he'd always say, never forget who you are and who you represent. Now, he wanted us to remember that we represent the company, but Peter here is saying, I want you to remember that you represent the kingdom. You represent the Lord Jesus Christ in everything that you do. And so I'm just going to pick out from this text that we read, Five rules for strangers and exiles. This is rules to help us in, in when we're asking that question, how should we live in the middle of everything that we're seeing going on? And rule number one, the rule that kind of drives and underpins everything else, is this. Fear isn't all bad. Now, uh, verse 16, Peter reminds us that we're free, but this freedom that we have in Christ is rooted in and thrives in a healthy fear of God. I don't think anyone ever got this idea better than C.S. Lewis. If you remember, they made a movie out of it, but he wrote the, those kids' books, uh, The Chronicles of Narnia. And in the, the, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, uh, he's take, here, let, let me set the scene. Uh, there's talking animals, if you're, if you're not familiar with it, and there's these human children come, and they're, they're, they're talking to Mr. Beaver, and Mr. Beaver is going to take them to meet Christ, the Christ figure. He's a giant lion uh, named Aslan. And in the, the scene, um, you know, that little Lucy goes, oh, I'll be so very afraid to, to, meet, to meet a lion, and, you know, it, 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 is it safe, and Mr. Beaver goes on to say, well, haven't, of course you'll be afraid. He's a lion, but he's good. That's sort of that picture when we think of the fear of God. Biblically speaking, uh, the fear of God is more than being afraid, but it's also more than just standing in awe. And in the Old Testament, when you'd read this term, the, the fear of the Lord, it's almost always accompanied by, if you look, it'll say the Lord in all capital letters. That's, that's His proper name, Yahweh. It's a covenant name. And He has bound Himself, this, this God, Yahweh, has bound Himself to us in a covenant love. In other words, in, in spite of my sin and in spite of my shame, this holy and righteous and incredible God draws me close and binds Himself to me and you out of love. And the, 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 the crazy irony in all of it is that the more clearly we see Him as high and lifted up and wonderful and holy, in other words, the more we realize that we shouldn't be close to Him, the closer He draws us to Him. And it doesn't just stop there. Paul explains this in a couple of places, but particularly in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 6, he says, because we're sons, God sent His Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, uh, Abba, Father. Here, l l let me explain that. Since we don't know how to respond to this holy and incredible God, He fills us with His Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit within us cries out, Abba. Now, as a, 
if you know me, this is one of these pet peeves. We, we, we like to say it means daddy. Well, that's close, but it, it doesn't really mean daddy. Okay, picture this. If there's a room full, of, room full of guys and my son walks in and he yells, or my son or my daughter, and they yell dad. Now, every guy in the room may turn around, but I know the voice of my, my kids. And they would have my undivided attention because I would recognize it's him. Abba is a personal name. Abba means my dad. This holy and wonderful and incredible, exalted God binds himself to you and I. We cry out, Abba. We recognize that we don't belong near him. And yet he draws us close to him through his son. Now, that, that is why Peter says, fear God. See, because when we get to that, that under, uh, undermines everything else and builds everything else up. Rule number two, honor where it is and isn't due. Notice Peter says, honor the emperor, honor the governors. Matter of fact, honor everyone. And you go, what? What do you mean, honor everyone? And this flows out of the, the, the reality that every person you meet is made in the image of God. And they're precious to Him. And God has placed in His wisdom uh, structures around us to help us to live well. But what in the world does it mean for us to give honor to everyone at appropriate levels? What's it, what's it mean to love everyone or honor everyone appropriately? And I've got a couple thoughts on that. And the first one is this. Be intentional to honor those who are different than us. Be intentional to honor those who are different than you. That, that, that may have a different background. Oh, you and I are so quick to rush in to offer commentary on, on what is what and why things are. Maybe it's time that we just slow down and listen. Maybe it's time that we honor people by just hearing their stories. Finding out where they come from. You see, we live in a very individualistic society. Uh, we, we think that we operate alone, but the reality is, unless you're Tom Hanks in that movie Castaway, you grew up in a system. And there is a system around you. People don't come from a vacuum. You didn't, and neither does anyone else. And you and I simply can't claim that we're immune from bias. Or that we have no culpability for the state of the world that we live in. That, that, that's why you and I have to be quick to listen first, to learn to honor people by hearing their stories and to, to know where they come from. We've got to be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. Didn't Jesus say that the ones who thought that they could see everything were really the blind ones, but the ones who admitted that they were blind were the ones who had sight? And we may find that, that in honoring those who are different than us, who come from different backgrounds, that have different stories, that we learn and that we grow, and that God creates a new heart in us through that. But the second uh, way that here that we have to honor is we have to be careful to honor the government. Uh, verses 13 and 17, he talks about this. And I'm not going to lie, here's one of those that you wish that there was an asterisk in the Bible, right? You wish that there was an asterisk here because then we would say, um, well, we could honor when such and such political system was in or when such and such party was in, depending on what side of the aisle that you're from. But Peter doesn't put that asterisk there, does he? And I'm going to be honest, I've had to do some repenting even in this past week here. Because we have to be careful to honor the, gov the government. And I'm talking about at a national level and at a local level and at uh, our police as well. This becomes especially difficult 
Let's, let's be honest. This becomes especially difficult when, when two parties that we're supposed to be honoring uh, experience tension. And when there's difficult there, and you, you say, well, well, then how do we honor everyone there? We honor both parties in persistent dialogue, thoughtful dialogue, if need be, peaceful demonstration. You see, often in our world, the, the, the loudest uh, voice gets heard first. But solutions require something different. They require a wider perspective. A um, minister that I, and professor that I respect a lot, a guy by the name of Carlos Skepton, he used to be at Johnson, he's now down at Harding University. Uh, he wrote this last week. He said, God, give us grace to move to the balcony. Get the bigger picture. Conceive wise, reasonable pathways out of our confusion. Let us bring to this not our angry selves or our shamed selves or our polarized selves, but our clearest centered selves. Slow down. Pray. Breathe. Listen. Love. Dream. Solve. And I would add to that, or I think the Apostle Peter would add to that, honor. But we've got to keep going here because we also have to be sensitive to honor the hurting. That's what he, one of those that we can't miss on. Uh, Paul talks about this in, in Romans chapter 12. He said, rejoice with those who rejoice, but weep with those who weep. Come alongside people. Share in their grief. One thing I, I've, I've noticed is that as we deal with grief, or you'll see this at funerals, we, we always feel like we have to say something. We feel like we have to give a theology lesson or offer some sort of bumper sticker cliche. I'm here to tell you maybe the best thing that we can do is to just to listen. Put your arm around somebody. Maybe help do the dishes. To, to, to come alongside um, we don't have to teach in those scenarios. And just to be honest, one of the most painful things that you can do to a hurting person is have them have to justify why they're hurting. Now, it does seem that something needs to be said here, that in honoring the hurting, sometimes there will need to be confrontation and accountability because we have to be willing to stand up for those that we honor and those that we love. Now, this last one may be the most difficult because we have to be diligent to honor those who are wrong. Remember, Peter says honor everyone. You know, when I watch on the videos and I see the men who chased down Ahmed Arbery, or Arbery and then I see senseless taking of lives, and then I see folks who uh, um, are using peaceful protest to turn into riots to cover up illicit, illicit activity. I say, how in, the world, how in the world do we honor them? And the reality is, is we're still required to honor them, and we honor them with appropriate justice and a fair trial and a proper legal system. We honor them by addressing systems and we need to take it further than this because we need to make these things personal. Because well, what about those of us who see injustice occurring around us and we walk along the other side of the street? We don't get involved. It can't just be about them as the source of the problem. We've got to take an honest look inward. We've got to look at uh, uh, our lives and our church. You see, because Peter says you honor everyone appropriately. But the third rule that we're going to get to here is um, one that's going to be even a little, it's easier. It's this, always love the fam. Verse 16, uh, Peter says, love the brothers and sisters. In other words, there should be a special love set aside for your brothers and sisters in Christ. 1 John 4, 7, the Apostle John writes, Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God. 
And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. In this context, he's talking about specifically Christians. Jesus prays this in his high priestly prayer, John 17. Christian love is a sacrificial commitment to one another based on the character of who God is. It's not necessarily a a mushy sort of love, you know, that's all excited about church potlucks and get-togethers, although that may be part of it. It's a commitment to one another based on who God is. You see, because the church, Jesus' church, is designed to be a structure support system for itself. It's designed that when one falls down, that there's others to come alongside to help up. That where one is weak, another comes along who's strong. Where one needs something, others can provide. That's the way that Jesus has designed His church. That's why He gives different gifts to all all the different folks within the church. And I'm going to tell you this. In an increasingly divided country, what what a time to see a united church. What a time to see a church who isn't divided, but who comes alongside and supports and loves one another. That's why Peter's saying, hey, let them see what you're doing. Let them see who you are. And I love that right now we're starting to see in increasing ways black churches and white churches talking more. But what if we can take it further than that and we worship together more? And we serve together more? And we love together more. You've got to always love the fam. Fourth rule we grab towels, not pitchforks. We grab towels, not pitchforks. Uh, Peter says, conduct yourselves honorably. Let your good deeds, right? Let them speak for themselves because when people start to talk trash about the church and when people are pointing fingers at the church, Oh, well, I, I loved it when I was a kid, um, The Wizard of Oz. It was a brand new movie when I was a kid. And uh, when, when the tin man finally gets to meet the wizard, you know, the wizard says, back where I'm from, we have folks that go around and all they do is good deeds all day. We call them good deed doers. Doers. Well, he could have said, we call them Christians. That's the picture that we want to be known as. Because sooner or later, folks are going to point the finger at the church and say, you're not welcome. What you believe isn't welcome. And we want them to see what we're doing. It's, it's like uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, where remember where the people start to grab the pitchforks because Frankenstein's, uh, uh, his creation isn't welcome. And he's saying sooner or later, people are going to grab pitchforks, but I'm here to tell you that Christians grab towels, not pitchforks. And what I mean by that is you think of Jesus on the night that he was betrayed. Stops and takes off his robe, wraps a towel around his waist. And he stops to, to serve. And to love. And you say, well, yeah, that, I get that in the church, but hold on. Jesus washed Judas' feet too. He loved folks that were going to cause him an inc- incredible pain. And honestly, isn't uh, uh, Philippians chapter 2, that is the whole point of Philippians 2. When you read it, it's that Jesus, we hear a lot of talk about privilege these days. Jesus didn't consider equality with God something for him to hold on to. And he pours himself out. And he serves. And he loves. Good deed doer. We won't silence the foolish talk of people about the church by you and I arguing about our rights. Let them see something different. Let them see love. Let them see honor. Let them see us doing good things. Last rule, rule five, be an infomercial. 
be an infomercial. Here, here's the deal. Your life and my life tells a story. Now, it, it, it can be a story of our accomplish, uh, accomplishments or a story of what we've collected. Or I, I hear us like to say this, you know, I come from the school of hard knocks and a, a story of the difficulty that we've been through. But I'm here to tell you the best stories are always redemption stories. Let your life be a story, a a picture of what Christ does. Because Christ did not come to make good people better. He didn't come to make bad people better. He came to make dead people alive. That's what He does. And let's make sure that the story of our lives bears witness to the truth of His gospel. Our, our, Our task, think about this, We've been reminded that our home is heaven, exiles and strangers. Our task as a church and as people who follow this Jesus is to make this look a little more like that. That's going to happen. By us telling our story, the story of what Jesus can do. Tell the story of the way that He comes and that He can take brokenness and put it back together. He can take addiction and bring freedom. He can take broken marriages and bring wholeness. He can take sin and and, and remove it and bring not a clean slate, but a whole new critter. Our story should tell His story about the way that He makes me a free man rather than a slave to sin. You see, my fear in God isn't a fear of punishment, but it's a, it's a fear that stands back and say, I, I realize I don't belong here, but I'm so thankful. So thankful to be here. And it's a story that honors us with His presence when all we do is bring shame. And it's a, it's a story of how He showed us love even when we didn't love him. And it's a story of how he wrapped a towel around his waist and he washed our feet when we would refuse to serve in the, low, in, in the simplest of ways. It's a story about how his entire ministry was a picture of the kingdom. Church, I need this in my own life. We need this as a church. We need this as a state. We need this as a country. The world needs us now to take this serious, to listen to the Word of God, and to, to not just keep it here, but to move it to here and then into our hands. Because this will define the way that we go through 2020 and the way that we go forward from there. Peter put it pretty simple. Honor everyone, love the brothers and sisters, fear God, honor the emperor. Back in the early days of the church, there was a a lawyer who came to Christ, and he became one of the real powerful thinkers in the first few years. His name was Tertullian. And when when folks were, were talking trash about the church, one of his writings, he said, let them look and see, and just say, see how they love one another. Oh, that that would be said of us. And I'm here to tell you, if today, if this all sounds crazy to you because you don't know Jesus as Lord, I want to invite you that by faith, put your, put your trust in Him to realize that there is a different home that is greater than all of this mess that we've seen in 2020. And there is a home where you can be welcome regardless of the sin and struggle and, or uh, what's happened in you or to you. Because there is a God that loves you so much that He sent His one and only Son. That if you would put your faith in Him, you wouldn't perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16. If that's you today, reach out. Reach out through the comment section. Reach out uh, somehow. Uh, there's, a, there's a connect card. 
Somehow, I'll get in touch with you today. We will talk about what it means to follow Jesus and what it means to have hope, what it means to have a new life. If you are a Christian and you, you've heard this and, and you're like, yeah, but I don't agree with this and I don't agree with this, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you there are lots of times when, when I hear new ideas or I hear things happening around us and I'm like, yeah, I get that. But you and I need to let God's Word speak into the way that we respond. We have to have a higher authority that governs us. Let God's Word challenge the way that we see the world around us and the way that we see the Christians around us and honestly even the way that we see ourselves. Church, pray with me. Father God, I thank You for the truth of your word and I thank you for the hope of tomorrow because of your son I thank you for the comfort that we have through your Holy Spirit that cries out Abba align our hearts and our minds to your word and your purpose your character today all for your glory in Christ's name